I've been interested in the ocean for as long as I can remember from the time that I was in elementary school. I was fortunate in that my family moved to Sarasota to Siesta Key when I was in high school. The area was a very different place before we moved here. There was a lot of dredge and fill activity that changed the nature of the bay dramatically until a lot of that was, was curtailed when people began to truly understand the importance of wetlands. Between my junior and senior years, I was able to get a volunteer position with Moat Marine Laboratory. We'd seen dolphins on Florida vacations that we'd had in the past. Sharks were really my passion at the time, but once we started working on the project to look at the interactions of sharks and dolphins in pools at Moat Marine, it became much more of an interest for me. Being able to, to do this day in and day out, being able to be around the professionals at Moat Marine Laboratory and learn about many things beyond just the sharks and the dolphins was what really got me anchored in wanting to be involved in marine science for a career. A lot of the understanding about the importance of marine life that came to be the realization of the people in Sarasota came from, from Moat Marine Laboratory and the fact that they had a, a world-renowned laboratory in their own town being able to share that information with the public, I think it made a difference. We didn't know, no one knew at that point, whether bottlenose dolphins in coastal waters stayed in one place or roamed widely. We began to not only see the same dolphins repeatedly in the same general area, but in many cases we were seeing them with the same associates. This is the place where we really began to understand dolphin societies and understanding how these animals live within a community is important to be able to conserve them appropriately. The dolphins are moving through the bay. We view it kind of like a kaleidoscope where if you turn things then you get different patterns as time goes on. We learned that some of the animals had pretty distinctive markings that stayed with them for a time, like a, a fingerprint. Some of them my staff can pick out very readily just by seeing them in the field. If they do something that inspires us to a particular name, they get that name. Nick Lowe, our oldest dolphin, has a low nick on her dorsal fin. Seems pretty obvious. Dr. Strange Notch is missing the tip of her fin with a strange little notch in the top of it. So it's however, whatever inspires us at any given time, we let the staff have parties and come up with names sometimes. We are currently observing dolphins that span five generations in Sarasota Bay. We observe the dolphins from the time they're born oftentimes until the time that they die. We have one dolphin that is 60 years old out in Sarasota Bay. We had a male that reached 50. We haven't seen him this year, but there's another male that was one of those two that we first tagged back in 1970 and 71 that is 47 years old. Each year they add on, they add one number to the limit that we know of, but they're pushing the upper limits, I'm sure. The 50s, especially the 60s and early 70s, was a time when dolphinariums were opening up all over the country, all over the world, actually. There was a small dolphinarium called Florida Land. There was a fellow there who was collecting dolphins for his own programs. He had dolphins in, in pools. He had dolphins that would go out and swim with the boat that he had for cruises out in the intercoastal waterway. But he was also supplying dolphins around the world. When we started doing our tagging, it was actually taking advantage of what he was doing. He didn't keep all the dolphins that he caught. He allowed us to tag the ones that he didn't want. And it gave us a basis of marked animals to be able to keep track of. So we took it one step farther in the mid 70s when we started using our own net to catch the dolphins for research purposes and tried to mark the animals so that commercial collectors would not come to Sarasota to take the animals because they would know that it wouldn't be worth their while in places in the Midwest, for example, where dolphins are maintained and exhibited, where millions of people can see them that wouldn't otherwise have the experience and might not get excited about helping the environment. There are people for whom those kinds of operations make a tremendous positive difference in terms of increasing their appreciation of the animals, and there are certainly detractors for those kinds of operations as well. We don't know exactly how many dolphins were taken out of Sarasota. The estimates are that there might have been about 60 dolphins taken by collectors from Tampa Bay down to Charlotte Harbor. These animals are well known, but that doesn't mean that they are free of any kind of threats from humans. In fact, human feeding of wild dolphins 
is an increasing issue throughout the southeastern U.S. But it's in Sarasota Bay where we've been able to do some of the first quantitative studies of that and understand what kinds of things can help bring about a positive change. There is one dolphin in southern Sarasota Bay named Beggar, and he got his name for good reason. We've tried various ways of dealing with his behavior to see whether or not we can reduce the interactions with people. Any boat that came over to try and interact with him in an illegal way, we talked to and explained it to them. And about half of the people that we talked to said they didn't know that there was a problem with doing that, and the other half said they didn't care and they were going to do it anyway. They get rewarded when people come up to them. They get the discarded fish, which the anglers legally have to discard over the side. It's going to take patience on the part of the anglers and working with, with scientists and others to try to come up with solutions that can work to the benefit of everyone and allow us to continue to enjoy being out there on the water and allow the dolphins a chance to survive. I feel like I'm one of the most fortunate people on the face of the earth. Just being able to have a good excuse to be around the water is good enough. But having these large mammals living in our backyard, these fascinating animals, is just incredible. And learning that they have lives going on in parallel to our own in the same neighborhoods. I live on Siesta Key, and I can kayak out behind my house and find dolphins that we've known for decades. And they're going about their lives just like I'm going about mine. But it's a lot more challenging for them, I would think. They've had to face a lot of changes to their habitat over the years, and yet they persevere. It's not that they packed up and left when the going got bad. I've learned to appreciate just what they have to go through to, to be able to, to carry on with their lives out there. We like to think that what's going on in our particular life on any given day is the most important thing that's happening. But you look at the other people driving past you on your way to work, and they're going on to do different things. You look out in the bay and you see the dolphins. They've got a full day ahead of them as well, just trying to survive. And humans have made that much more difficult with the things that they've inflicted upon them over the years. Dolphins are very intelligent, obviously. That's part of the fascination. That's part of the, the wonder of having them living out here. We don't have to believe that they're humans in wetsuits to be able to appreciate them. We don't have to give them mystical powers or anything like that. They're just really neat animals the way they are. They're adapted to living in an environment that's very foreign compared to what we would be able to survive in, and they do quite well in it most of the time. One of the things that we've learned is that this really is home for these dolphins. The fact that we see these dolphins here across multiple decades, across multiple generations of related individuals, through thick and thin, it truly is their home. When we go out on the water, some of us are out there making our livelihood doing that, but most of the people that are out there are out there for recreational purposes, to enjoy what brought them here in the first place. And that's all good and fine, but we need to recognize the fact that we are visitors to the dolphin's home. They have no other place to go, so we need to respect it as their home and serve as good stewards of their home, and that will in turn reap benefits for us as well.